Um, so my name is Michael Matongo, and I'm reading uh, today's uh, scripture reading, and the title is called Soul's Conversion, and the reading is from Acts 9, uh, verse 1 to 9, and 17 to 19. Uh, so it reads, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous uh, threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked for letters to the synagogues in, in Damascus, so that if he found any they who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, So, so, why do you persecute me? Then he asked, Who are you, Lord? So, so asked, sorry. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you'll be told what you must do. Um, verse 7. Um, then the, the men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got, got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could, he could see nothing. Um, so they, they led him uh, by hand into Damascus. For three days, he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. Um, turning on to verse 17. Um, then Ananias um, um, went to the house and entered it, placing his hand on Saul. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized and after taking some food, he regained his strength. This is the reading of God's word. Amen. Fam, we're starting a new series today. And the name of the series says it all. There you go. Basic Discipleship. Why do we have this series? Because we are a disciple-making church. We remind ourselves of this every single Sunday. You guys should know it by now. As the gospel transforms the individual life of a person, we want to see a multiplying effect of that, and we believe that happens best by the making of disciples. Questions. How do we know if the gospel transforms someone? Have you ever thought about that? How do we know if it has a multiplying effect? Because we say, as it transforms, we want to uh, see it have a multiplying effect. How do we know? How do we know, in short, if we are making disciples? The best way to answer these questions, I believe, is by having a clear understanding and description of what a disciple looks like. Think about it. What do they do? How do they act? And how do they know if they are growing as disciples themselves? These questions that I just lobbed at you were questions that we spent time grappling with during the month of September. And if I say we, it's myself, Lesejo, and Josie. Now, the Holy Spirit was gracious to us in that time as we grappled with these questions in guiding our thoughts and also all of our creative conversations. So we designed a discipleship journey for everyone at Fellowship City after these conversations. This discipleship journey, listen to me, is supposed to be a clear understanding and a description of what a disciple looks like. And we hope and pray and believe that it will catalyze growth in us as we have this picture and as we grow into this picture. Can I show you the picture? This is what our discipleship journey looks like. I'm going to explain it to you briefly. Okay? We say a disciple loves God and loves people. That's very biblical and that's at the core of your journey as a disciple. Or we'll said the other way around, if you don't love God and you don't love people, fam, you're not a disciple. But Jesus says the great commandment according to him is love God and love people. Okay, that sounds great. All of us could say, yeah, yeah. The question following a statement like that is always, okay, how? Like, actually, how do I do this? Yes, cool, I'm in, but how? We say at Fellowship City, a disciple knows God. A disciple commits faithfully. 
and a disciple gives generously. There you go. The disciple knows God, commits faithfully, gives generously. Okay, now I'm starting to get some handles on this journey. So knowing, committing, and giving, yes, but how? One level deeper. The disciple knows God through his word. The disciple knows God through encountering him. And the disciple knows God through worship. A disciple commits faithfully. Okay, cool. What do I commit to? Well, you commit to the transformation of yourself through the Holy Spirit. Okay? Changing from one thing to the other. You commit to God's people. That's the church. God's community. The church community. And you also commit faithfully to the mission of the church. Not only Fellowship City's mission, small C church, but also the Great Commission, right? Going to all nations and making people disciples. That's what you commit to. A disciple gives generously. Cool. What do I give? I give generously of time, talents, and treasure. Okay? So I give of my time through serving. I give of my talents through my gift like the gift that God has given me, and I give of my treasures through me giving my money. There you go. That's our discipleship journey. Is it clear? I mean, many of you heard it for the first time now. Don't worry if it's overwhelming and it's too much and you can't remember all of it. We are going to explain this many more times. This journey is also supposed to enable people to talk about their own discipleship journeys and faith with each other. Somehow, we really struggle as a church family to talk about our relationship with Jesus. And somehow we also struggle as Christians to talk, about other, uh, to talk to people who are not Christians about our faith and about our relationship with Jesus. And it shouldn't be that way. So this journey makes it really easy. <laughs> like if you ever want to tell someone what it's all about to follow Jesus, there you go. If you ever want to tell someone what Jesus is busy shaping inside of you, there you go. It gives you handles. It gives you a clear picture and a clear understanding. So in the next six weeks, we are going to do six sermons on the discipleship journey. Two sermons focusing on each corner of the triangle. Fam, these actions and these responses that I just showed you are really basic. And that's why we call this series Basic Discipleship. Today's sermon sits in the top corner. So today's sermon is all about knowing God through encountering Him. Do you see that? That's where we're going to eat today. Okay. Encountering God is one of the ways through which we know Him and through which we get to know Him more intimately. Can I ask you a question? When do you or did you encounter God? When do you or did you encounter God? God. Something transformative happens to us when we encounter God. The shortest possible answer I can give to you is we are converted. That's what conversion is. So you have an encounter with God and you are converted. Now this story of Paul that Mike read to us, the story of Paul's conversion, helps us to see a pattern of how this happens. Right? So we are in the book of Acts. The book of Acts, historically, or in terms of the biblical timeline, is after Jesus' birth, life, death, resurrection, and ascension. It's before His return. He has already poured out His Holy Spirit over the church, and now the church is taking the mission forward. The church is continuing the work of Jesus. Now, this version of Paul's conversion that we just read in Acts 9, there are three versions of that. You also find it in Acts 22 and in Acts 26. Okay, so I'll show you some parts out of Acts 26. So I said this is a pattern for us. That's not my own words. Let's look at Paul. He says in 1 Timothy 1, 15 to 16, he says, This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. There you go. That's the gospel. And I am the worst of them. We'll get to that now. 
But I received mercy for this reason, so that in me, the worst of them, Christ Jesus might demonstrate His extraordinary patience as an example to those who would believe in Him for eternal life. So we have a pattern here. Let's study it. And let's see what happens when we encounter God. Four things this morning. What happens to us when we encounter God? We start thinking. We see anew. We finish a struggle. And we see ourselves clearly and receive the gospel. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, your word is um, alive. Cuts deep. It's a lamp to our feet. It's a way of knowing you. It's also a way of encountering you. And the word is open now, and we are so ready to be transformed by it as we encounter you. I pray, Father God, that as we read your words and as we read how you showed yourself to the Apostle Paul, that we would be transformed today. And that these four things that we just saw happening to us, that that would happen to us in this place. It is a work that only you can do, Lord Jesus. And therefore, we trust you with it. Please help us not to be distracted. Please help us not to wander off. Please help us to engage your word and to feast on it. We pray that in your name. Amen. Okay, let's look at the first one. What happens to us when we encounter God? We start thinking. Okay, nine verses on the slide. Look at all the highlights, okay? Paul is still breathing threats and murder. Paul wants permission to arrest people belonging to the way. Paul wants to take them prisoner. Look at verse 4. Then something happens. Paul hears. Paul speaks back. And all of a sudden, Paul is blind for three days. And he doesn't drink or eat. According to Paul, Jesus is dead. According to Paul, the people of the way, the church, the people who have the Spirit in, in them, sharing the good news, are wrong. According to Paul, he is right. And according to Paul, those people deserve to be punished, jailed, and executed. Paul would bet his life on it. Paul is 100% convinced that that is the truth, fam. Look at the first few verses. He's persecuting this church. And now Jesus speaks to him. Verse 4. Uh, just by the way, the one who he says is dead. Appears to him. Verse 4. He hears Jesus speak. Verse 4. He answers Jesus. Verse 5. And now he has to think about it. He's forced to think about it because you're dead. But now you're not. <laughs> and I really believed that you were dead. But you're not. What do I do? He has to think. And Paul goes on a three-day reflection. Fam, when was the last time you thought about something for three minutes? Maybe even 30 minutes. Do you know how intense it is to think for three days? I mean, all of us working in spaces where you have to do strategic planning or where you sit in a boardroom, you know, like three hours of strategic planning and you're all tired. Paul thinks for three days. Why? This is really important. He gets confronted with truth outside of him. Do you see it? Not his truth. The truth. And when Paul gets confronted with the truth, he has to make a decision. It's yes or no. No maybes if you get confronted with truth. And Paul goes, okay, I'll go to the city. Do you see that? Like we often talk about next steps as disciples. Next steps means giving the next step, not necessarily knowing exactly where all of this is going to lead. It's a step of faith. A step of obedience. Now Paul says, okay, I'll go to the city. <laughs> because that's literally what Jesus told me to do. Paul didn't have a clue how this story would unfold. 
And also, fam, listen, Paul was a tough nut to crack. Paul didn't want to believe. Paul wasn't your friend who's been asking questions and asking questions about Jesus and the Bible and about faith and about obedience and the Holy Spirit. Paul wanted nothing of it. But he encounters God and he starts to think. And he starts to think of his own convictions. Fam, the same happens to us. When, when God reveals, right, the truth of his love for us. When God reveals his sovereignty over all things to us. When God reveals his grace to us. When God reveals his glorious provision to us. When God reveals himself to us as the one who is all powerful, right? His omnipotence. When God reveals himself to us as the one who is everywhere. His omnipresence. We start thinking. The moment you encounter God and that truth comes to you, you start thinking. And we can, like Paul, believe something and like really believe it that simply isn't the truth. Do you see that? It's actually a scary thought. And only the truth being revealed to us through encounter can jolt us into thinking about that truth that we believe to be the truth. Only an encounter with God sends us into this mode of wrestling with this thing. Only an encounter of, with God leads us to a place where we say, I have to make up my mind about this. Right? I was thinking of my own conversion story this week. Fam, I actually believed that I am missing out of the things that this world can offer me. Like before I got saved, before I got converted, I believed that the things the world offers me, like money, booze, influence, sex, blah, 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 that will give me what I long for. And a relationship with Jesus won't. I actually believed that. I believe that the world could offer me something that Jesus cannot. On the contrary, Jesus is a party pooper. And he's going to take me away from all of those things that all my friends say are so fun. I believe that to be the truth. And I had everything going for me in that time. And I chose against stewarding it well and leaning into it. And the evening I got saved, the evening I got converted, the evening I encountered God... I was confronted with the truth. And the truth that I was confronted with that evening was that I had no idea how to control or manage my own life. Like that was the truth that came to me as I was lying there on my bedroom floor. I literally felt God saying to me, you made a real mess of this, give it all back to me, I know what I'm doing. And I had to start thinking. I literally, like in that moment, I went, oh, snap, I'm running my own life into the ground. And what I did that evening was to say, okay, okay, I'll go to the city, like Paul. What I said was, okay, here it is, because that's what you're asking me for. You're saying, give it back to me, there you go, take it. Here is my life, you know far better what to do with it than I do. Woke up the next morning. And I remember going from 0 to 120 really fast and feeling really overwhelmed with everything that was going on in my head. Because now all of a sudden I'm thinking about grace. I didn't think about grace last night. I thought about girls. Now I'm thinking about sin. I didn't think about sin yesterday. I thought about money. Now I'm thinking about forgiveness. And how does that work? Now I'm thinking about how many chances do I get? One, two, three, four, a gazillion? Like, how does this old Christian, you get another chance thing work? All of a sudden, I'm grappling with, wh what about everything I did in my past? Like, do I have to pay for it? Do I have to go and say sorry to everyone? Like, there's a whole lot of stuff in my past that's not great. H how does this whole vibe work? What should I do next? Like, those were all the thoughts that I woke up with the next morning. And do you know what my next move was? My next move was calling someone and asking for help. Like, that's literally what I did. I'll be... Sherm, I need your help. He was a pastor at that time. He gave me his phone number six months prior to that. And I was like, dude, you need to help me because my head's going to burst. I am thinking because I encountered God on my bedroom floor last night. And you really need to help me sort this out. Okay. 
I know that some of you might think, listen, Paul has some really great evidence. Okay? I mean, Paul heard Jesus, saw Jesus coming to him in this light. You might even listen to my story and go, yeah, well, okay, dude, think about it. God spoke to you in a voice that you could actually hear what he was saying to you. If I had that kind of evidence, I could probably also believe the same way that you do. Fam, I want to say to you that even though I hear you, the evidence that you have today is not underwhelming. Real experiences of God and his presence doesn't mean acceptance of the truth. Let's bring in our boy Judas here. Do you guys realize that Judas was as close to Jesus as Peter was? And he still chose against him. Do you guys realize that even after Jesus was resurrected from the dead, the Bible says some disciples saw him chowing a fish and they doubted. Real experiences doesn't mean that you'll believe the truth. We have enough evidence. You know, after the church has existed for more than 2,000 years and has never retreated but only advanced, you know of the billions of people confessing Christianity saying Jesus is as real to me as this music stand holding my Bible. There's enough evidence for you. Hey, we've got a Bible, 66 books, beautiful, solid story that all leads to Jesus. It's all there. We experience God not only through nature but also through His Spirit. The question is, will you respond to that as truth and think about it or not? When you encounter God, will you think about it or not? Look, I don't know where you are in terms of encounter with God. And I also don't know exactly what you need to do next. But fam, a simple prayer like God, please reveal yourself to me, is a great prayer to pray. A simple prayer like, God, I need truth. Because I am believing things that's not leading me to the abundant life. I am believing things that's leading me away from you and away from what you created me for. Please give me truth. God will meet you there with truth. And you will encounter Him. Okay, it might not be as personal as please reveal yourself to me. What about asking someone in this church, Please help me think, help me search, help me grapple, help me wrestle. I'm having a hard time. Feels like my head is too small and there are too many theological things to hold. But I need to see this clearly. I need to make up my mind about this. Because God has, encounter, uh, God has, uh, uh, has revealed himself to me through encounter. When we encounter God, we start thinking. Let's look at the second one. When we encounter God, we see anew. Now follow along with me. Look at my highlights. Can I have the next slide, please, and so forth? Lots of references to sight and to seeing and to blindness. Look at it. Though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. A confirmation of that in verse 9, he was unable to see. Then Ananias pitches in verse 17, and Ananias says, dude, listen, I'm here so that you may regain your sight. And then it says something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. And the moment he could see, he could also see. Do you guys see what I did there? It's more than just physical sight. Paul was against Jesus, persecuting him. Now he can see and he's getting baptized. <laughs> Guys, just think about it. Scales falls off. Paul goes, I mean, how do I do this? Where's my membership card? Dude, your membership card is baptism. Cool, baptize me, baptize me now. Do you guys see how radical that is? Because Paul saw a new. Christian conversion involves spiritual sight. Christian conversion involves, listen to this, I'm playing with words, an awareness of spiritual blindness and a consciousness of spiritual sight. You guys know this feeling. You don't know you are dreaming while you are dreaming. But when you are awake, you know, oh, Luckily, that was just a dream. 
Do you guys see the difference? Like while you're spiritually blind, you've got no idea that you're spiritually blind. But when you start actually seeing God for who He is through encounter, then you look back and go, my word, look how blind I was. I can't believe that I didn't see this. It's the same with a dream. It feels really intense in that moment when Eben eats a bit, Elizabeth comes running at me. And then I wake up and I go, I'm all sweaty because it felt, it felt so real. But it wasn't because I'm, I'm awake now. And I know that that was just a dream. That's what happens when we encounter God, fam. When we see, we see how blind we were. I never saw that, but, but now I do. That's what an encounter does to us. So it's more than just thinking. It is seeing everything in a new way and a new light with that feeling and knowing the reality of how blind we've been. I mean... This might resonate with some of you, but you remember when you actually saw your sin for what it is, the clarity that you saw it with. When you saw the lies of the evil one for how it is. When you saw how far you've wandered from God's path, you see it clearly. All of a sudden you see how futile your priorities are. All of a sudden you see how caught up you are in your own agendas and your own desires. That's what happened to the brother, Paul. And that's what happens to us when we encounter God. And for three days, this is what Paul was busy with, grappling with these things. And then he says, I've been blind, but now I see my life in a whole new way. And not only that, I can now see that others are blind and I have to help them see. See? See. That's also... Yes. Acts 26, 15 to 18. Read it with me. So this is Paul telling his story of conversion again, adding details that we don't have in Acts chapter 9. Okay? So look at verse 15. That's the same as in Acts 9. Who are you, Lord? And the Lord replied, I'm Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Okay, Laka, get up and stand on your feet. Yes, that's also Acts chapter 9. But then look at this. Jesus says something else to Paul that we don't find in chapter 9. He says, I appeared to you for this purpose to appoint you as a servant and a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. I will rescue you from your people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to do what? Look at verse 18. To open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a share among those who are sanctified in faith by me. They are blind, Paul. They need to see. You were blind. Now you can see. Help the blind to see. I'm sending you to them. I don't know what's on your prayer list, but when was the last time you prayed a prayer like this? God, what do you want to show me? What do you want to show me? Or, say differently, what do you want to open my eyes to? <whistles> Fam, what a prayer. What a prayer. Why not pray it? Like, if you don't feel like you've seen a new if you don't feel like you've encountered God and that has given you way new sight, pray that prayer. Show me. Open my eyes. Maybe a prayer isn't enough for you as a next step. What about this one? What about you approach someone who you know and love, hopefully if you're married it's your spouse, and you say, what am I not seeing? Help me. Like, what am I not seeing? What am I blind to that's keeping me in darkness? I know that that sounds very scary. I know. But fam, if we are committed to our own growth, if we are committed to our own discipleship, we have to have the courage to ask this question. 
you guys know I'm a runner. I need to go to my coach and say, coach, what do I need to work on? Because I know I'm not a perfectly well-rounded athlete. What do you see, coach, I need work on? And then if he says, dude, we need to work on your speed, do you know what I do? I don't look at him and say, I cannot believe that you have the audacity to tell me that I'm slow. No. I say, thanks, coach. Show me the way. Give me the program. I want to do what you said because I want to be a better athlete. Why not try that? Ask someone close to you, what am I blind to? When we encounter God, we see you new. When we encounter God, we also finish a struggle. Let me tell you what I mean. Look at uh, the slide. It's got verse 4, 5, 9, and 18. It's kind of a summary of Paul's struggle. Okay? Paul struggled with the Jesus movement. And Paul persecuted the Jesus, uh, the Jesus movement to put it to an end, to nip it in the bud. And twice, Jesus says, Paul, you are fighting with me. Have you guys ever had that feeling in an argument? That you think that at the moment you're staying calm, and then the other person says, don't fight with me? And then you go, I I'm not fighting with you, I'm just saying. And the other person goes, no, no, no listen. Take it a few clicks down, you're fighting with me. That's what Jesus says to Paul. Paul, you're fighting with me. You're fighting with me. You're fighting with me. For three days, Paul went, snap, I am fighting with you. And then all of a sudden, Paul's not fighting anymore. Do you see that the struggle is finished? Something changed through an encounter with Jesus. Okay. Now, Paul adds a really important detail in Acts chapter 26, in this specific part of his story. Look at it with me, it's just verse 14, Acts 26. Paul says, we all fell to the ground and I heard a voice speaking to me in Aramaic, that's an added detail. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? We've read that. And then there's this beautiful little line, it's hard for you to kick against the goads. So Paul says, that's what Jesus said to him. Jesus said to him, why are you persecuting me? It's hard for you to kick against the goads. So what, what are goads? Goads, well, a, a goad or goads, it's a stick that's got a sharp point. It looks like a spear. And it's something that shepherds would use back in the day to go, yeah, don't walk that way, walk that way. So it's something that a shepherd uses to create pain and discomfort for their creatures that they're looking after. Why? Because they like hurting them? No. It's because of their own good. Think about it, fam. A nice little herd of sheep going down uh, a very steep mountain or hill. The shepherd would go, you are going to die over there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Get back, get back, get back. Do you see that? Now, obviously... The sheep have a little jump because it's painful, man. You know, it's not like a dog. Hey, come so man, come here. It's not how it works. It's a prod. It's, just, it's uncomfortable. It's pain. But you'll die there if I don't save you through causing you pain. The moment of, of encounter or the moment of conversion might seem really sudden, right, from the story we have. It might actually feel sudden if you think of your own story. But when you reflect on it, you'll see that before any encounter, there's a struggle. You'll see that there's a kicking against the goads of Jesus, wanting you to take a different path. And Paul knew that struggle full well. Paul says in Romans 7, read it with me, maybe I'm not as good as I think. It's actually not time for Romans 7 yet. Sorry and so forth, my bad. We'll get to that later. But Paul talks about the struggle in Romans 7 where he says, I realize that I'm not as good as I think. I realize that my obedience to the law can't save me. Think about Paul in Acts chapter 7. What happened in Acts chapter 7? Stephen was being stoned. 
who stood there listening to his whole speech and seeing every single rock fall on Stephen's head? Paul. And what did Stephen say? Your obedience to the law cannot save you. There's only one name by which you can be saved, and that is Jesus Christ. And Paul goes, stop it, stop it, stop it. It's painful. It's causing me discomfort. It's pushing me to a side where I don't want to go. Because I'm realizing that Jesus is calling me closer, but I'm kicking against it. Have you ever seen a sheep kick? Unbelievable. I mean, ball of wool. And then all of a sudden they go into gymnastics posture. Whoop! That's what kicking against the goads is. And Paul says, these things are causing me pain. I'm struggling. I know I'm on the wrong path. But instead of surrendering to Jesus, kill him. That's kicking against the goads. Jesus has long called Paul back. But Paul didn't want to listen. Who do you think gave Stephen's speech to Luke to write? Paul. It's the longest speech we have in Acts. Paul went, Luke, listen, that day it all changed for me. That was my moment. Like I just, I couldn't kick against the goads anymore. Here's what Stephen said. And then Luke goes, in Acts chapter 7, I mean, it's a work of art. It's phenomenal. That was the moment for Paul. Let me ask you a few questions. What are your deepest struggles and fears at the moment? What are your deepest struggles and worst fears at the moment? Are you struggling with your identity? And therefore looking for it in your work? And not finding it there? Is your biggest struggle idolatry? Right? You're worshipping marriage. And then when you're at odds with your spouse, your whole life falls apart. Is your idolatry money? And then the moment you lose money, your whole life crumbles. Can you see how all of those things are goads bringing you back to Jesus because you're trusting in something other than Him? Then you don't get the promotion. You don't get the applause in the boardroom. Your investment doesn't work out and you lose your money. Your marriage is a much harder graft than you hope. All of those things, if you worship those things, are goads. They are pain and discomfort through which Jesus is bringing you back. Stop worrying about what the boardroom thinks of you. Get back to me. Because you're running off looking for the approval of man. You'll die there because no one will ever be happy with you, fam. That's goads. Is the pain you're currently experiencing the goads of Jesus? Because if it is, as your brother and your pastor, I want to tell you, don't kick against it. Don't kick against it. Follow it. Accept it. Work with it. Follow the pokes. An encounter with God brings us to this moment where you say, okay, I am done kicking against this. I am now going to follow, I will obey, and this settles the struggle. You see that? Paul was baptized in verse 18. I'm done struggling. Done kicking against the goats. If I think of my own conversion story, fam, I was in two really bad car accidents. I totaled two cars. Those were goads. That was pain and discomfort bringing me back. When I lived overseas, we were in so many street brawls where we were absolutely battered by other oaks. And then you wake up the next morning in bed and you go, my word, it's, I'm bloodied everywhere. I've got roasties. What on earth is going on? One evening we had such a bad street brawl that it almost cost me my job overseas and my accommodation. The landlord said, that's it, pack your stuff and go. All of those things were goads, painful, not pleasant. But God through that saying to me, you need to stop this. Any wrestling fans in the house? Okay, tough crowd. You guys know the sport of wrestling, right? Whether it is Olympic style 
jumpsuits, Greco-Roman wrestling, sumo wrestling, or really hardcore WWE. There's something in wrestling called a submission hold. Well, you get that in UFC as well. A submission hold is when someone has you in a grip, and they've got you. And you know, you know, you know you're not going to get out of that grip. But you struggle, and you struggle, and you struggle, until eventually you tap out. Until eventually you circle, that's me. Fam, listen. If Jesus has you in a submission hold, you're not going to break it. I promise you. He is much stronger than you. He calls Paul twice. Paul, uh, Saul, Saul, come to me. I have a deep, deep desire for you. Lord Jesus, are you goading me? What a prayer. What a prayer. I mean, Jesus knows your pain. He knows your struggle. But maybe today you see it in a way new light. Ask Him. Are you goading me? Are you causing me pain and discomfort because I'm on the wrong path? Ask your trusted confidants in the Christian community, am I kicking against the goads? Sometimes you wouldn't see it, but someone standing outside might see you kicking against the goads. Ask them, am I resisting God's work in my life? Am I kicking against the goads? Let's go to the fourth one. I'm almost done. What happens to us when we encounter God? We start thinking, we see anew, we finish the struggle, and here's the last one. We see ourselves clearly, and we receive the gospel. Uh, look at the highlights again with me. We've seen verse 4 and verse 5. Paul is fighting with Jesus. Bad fight to pick. Do not do it. You will lose. You will not cross start and uh, receive 200 rand, right? You cannot win a fight against Jesus. Okay, so Paul fought against Jesus. What do you think Jesus did back to Paul? Do you guys remember those old TV games where someone would stand there reeling and then the game would say, finish him. And then Raiden would slide in Mortal Kombat. Boop, 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 boop. Is that what Jesus does? Finish him. Absolutely not. Jesus puts him back together. <laughs> yes. Yes for grace. Yes for the gospel. Look at it. The Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road you were traveling has sent me to you so that you may regain your sight and he wants to live inside of you. Fam, when was the last time you invited one of your enemies to come and share a house with you? That's what Jesus does through his grace. Jesus goes, okay, so now that this fight is settled, I want to move in. In, in. I don't, really, I don't want to be close. I want to be in you. What a moment. Here's the thing. When we encounter God, we see ourselves clearly and we receive the gospel. Do you know what that means? That means that in that moment of encounter, here's what you say. Look at what I've done. And then, <laughs> look what He's done. <laughs> That's the gospel. That's the encounter moment. I realized up until this point in my sermon, I haven't quoted anyone. So let me quote the guy who taught me that I always have to have a quote in my sermon, Tim Keller. Here you go. The gospel is this. We are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever did believe. Let's just stop there. Fam, what do you think Paul thought about for those three days? That he didn't eat or drink and he couldn't see. Oh my word, what have I done? What have I said? Who have I told? Who have I taught? How have I been wrong? Stephen shouldn't have died. Stephen should be alive. I was wrong. There you go. You are more flawed than you ever did believe, fam. And, and, yes for an and. Yet, at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever did hope. 
Paul elaborates on this, seeing himself clearly and receiving the gospel. Let me just show you, apart from Romans 7, from the New Living Translation. Paul says, I have discovered this principle of life, that when I want to do what is right, I, inev I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, but there's another power within me that is at war with my mind. And this power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. And look at him. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God. The answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. So you see how it is. In my mind, I really want to obey God's law, but because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. Every time you encounter God, you see yourself clearly. You realize how broken and sinful you are, and you receive God's love anew. Maybe today that's your moment. Maybe today the moment for you is appreciating both of these things again and anew. Maybe this is something, can I just have the Keller quote back on, please, and so forth. Maybe this is something that you have to come back to. Maybe this is something that you've forgotten. Maybe today is your day in which you say, yes, I believe that. I believe that. I trust it with all my weight. Do not kick against the goads if today is your day. Do it. Do it now. Amen. I want to give us a, an opportunity to respond. Okay? We are here now. The Spirit has moved among us. We heard God's Word. And I don't know what your next step is, but you know. And if you feel it today, don't kick against it. Accept it. We spoke about the thinking space and we said to each other a simple prayer like, God, reveal yourself to me. Maybe that's, your, maybe that's your next step. Maybe that's your response. We spoke about looking for someone to help you search and grapple and wrestle with. Maybe that's your response. I am going to pray for everyone responding this morning. Okay? I just want to walk through them. We spoke about the seeing part of encountering God. We spoke about the simple prayer of, God, what do you want to show me? What do you want to open my eyes to? We spoke about that scary question of asking someone who knows you really well. That's where question of the day comes from, just by the way. to do. If you haven't seen it yet, maybe asking someone, what am I not seeing? What am I blind to? What's keeping me in the darkness? Fam, maybe the struggle in your life is real today. Maybe your response to this message is, Lord, are you goading me? And am I kicking against it? And lastly, we spoke about a response that says, yes, I believe, I trust, I heard it, this settles it. The gospel, I saw myself clearly this morning, and I received the gospel again. If you are any of those people, I want you to close your eyes because I want to pray for you and then after we've prayed, we'll sing. Lord Jesus, Father God, Holy Spirit, when you revealed yourself to people in the Bible, it was almost, almost as if they couldn't handle it. And in the 2,000 years since you came, Lord Jesus, so many people testify about encountering you, feeling overwhelmed by your character and your awesomeness. Everyone would testify that that changed them. And I pray this morning for my brothers and sisters who needs to see you who needs to encounter you and who needs to start thinking about the truth that's embodied in you, Lord Jesus. Reveal yourself to them, Father God. May this be the jolt that they needed. May they find the right people 
to struggle through these things and to wrestle it through. For all of us who need to see, I think of the old worship song, Lord Jesus, open the eyes of our hearts so that we can see you. Help us to see others who are blind. Help us to help them see. Show us, Lord Jesus, what you, what you need to show us. Lord Jesus, for some of us, the struggle is real. And the struggle is so intense and it's so complex. We might not even be able to know what we're struggling with, but we know that we're struggling. I want to thank you for being a loving and a good shepherd and that you goad us, that you save us from the cliff and that you save us from death, even though it sometimes comes with pain and discomfort. We are willing to take it, Lord Jesus. And I'm praying for my brothers and sisters who might be there this morning, knowing that you're goading them, that they would stop kicking against the goads. Lord Jesus, thank you that we are more loved than we ever, ever, ever could imagine. Thank you that you came to live inside of us, even though we were your adversaries, we were your enemies. We were persecuting you like Saul. Thank you for your grace and for your mercy. We believe that your death on the cross counts for us and that it frees us from this life of sin, that you are the answer. Settle all of this in our hearts this morning, Lord Jesus. And may we be transformed. May we encounter you. May we know you. We pray that in your name.